I'll be honest and say, I think we all probably have a lot more fear in our life than what we might even recognize. And uh, usually if you've got a big fear, like a heart pounding, you know, this is really, oh, I'm so afraid. You, you get that, you know. But I think there's a lot of little underlying fears that have been around for so long that we've just kind of gotten comfortable with them and don't even really recognize that they're there. How many of you think that could possibly be the case? And so I'm for, let's be free from fear, okay? And you can't be free from anything that you don't recognize and learn how to deal with. And so um, then when you do recognize it, you got to confront it, you got to face it. One thing about fear is you cannot run from it and ever get away from it. That's what fear loves to do. It loves to chase you and watch you run. And what God wants us to do is confront things and deal with things and know that because he's with us, we can do anything, anytime, anywhere that we need to do. You're going to probably hear me say a good number of times this weekend, God is with you. That's the main reason the Bible gives for not being afraid. Fear not, for I am with you. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And some things we hear so much that we just get so used to hearing them that they don't mean to us what they should mean. And if you really take the time to stop throughout your day and think, now God is with me right now. God is with me in this. I'm never alone. God is with me. It becomes a greater conscious reality to you. And it starts to get really cool to realize that you and life, you and God are doing life together. Isn't that awesome? See, I don't know if you know this or not, but he doesn't just live in the church building. <laughs> you don't just go see God on Sunday morning. You are the church. You are the temple of God. You are his building. And he lives in you. And he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. So, fear means to run from. The, the basic definition, if you look it up in Greek, means to take flight. To run from. And in another place in Hebrews, it says that we're not to shrink back in fear. So fear can cause us to shrink back. In other words, not to do what we know we're supposed to do or to say what we're supposed to say. How many times in life have we felt like we needed to talk to somebody about something and we really felt like we should do it, but we just say, well, I just don't like confrontation. Well, you know, just because you don't like something doesn't mean that you don't need to do it. We don't all like everything we do. That's, that's why we need the Holy Spirit in us to show us what to do so we can courageously follow him. So courage is doing it afraid. Courage is doing what you know you should do even though you might feel afraid. If you think that you're going to have a time in your life where you never ever feel fear, you're sadly mistaken. You will feel fear at different times in your life until you're no longer in a human body because that is the devil's number one weapon that he uses against God's people to keep them from their God-ordained destiny. Amen. Amen. Wonder how many people sit in here tonight that have backed off from something at some time in your life that was something you were really supposed to do that would have turned out to be really, really, really a cool, awesome thing. <laughs> and now you've just got a little bit of this, oh, I wish I would have. Well, you know what? Let's don't get over here on this side of life and live with regrets. Let's start doing what the Bible tells us to and live by faith. Now, the devil has got plenty of fear and it's like a poison, but God has given us an antidote for fear and it's faith. 
faith. When fear knocks on your door, send faith to answer. Amen? Now, if you do a little bit of study on poisons and antidotes, you know that there are certain antidotes that work on certain poisons. And so if you got poisoned, you would go to the hospital and tell them what you took or what bug bit you or whatever, and they would tell you the antidote. Well, the Bible teaches us that the enemy will come against us with fear, that it is an evil spirit, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And we're encouraged all over the Bible to walk by faith, to live by faith. And so let me just throw this out. I think a lot of times people get in faith or they use their faith when they have some kind of an emergency. Well, I really, I need a breakthrough. So we think we're going to pray this prayer of faith and we're going to get a breakthrough. But the Bible never tells us to do that. It says to live by faith. The just man shall live by faith. We must exercise our faith every moment of every day. We're to live by faith, to walk in faith. And in Romans 1.17, we're told that there is a righteousness, which is a, has all to do with our relationship, our personal relationship with God. There is a righteousness that's revealed in the Bible that leads us from faith to more faith to more faith. And so this all gets into the whole area of knowing that God loves you and that he loves you completely and that he's just proud of you and has a good plan for your life and that you're made right with him through the blood of Christ and that you're forgiven of your sins. And so the more you understand righteousness and all of its implications, the more your faith builds and the more your faith builds, the more courageous you're going to be. Now, let me say it again. The more your faith builds, the more courageous you're going to be, because if you're ever going to do anything worth doing, you're gonna have to be willing to be wrong to find out if you're ever right. And see, people who are afraid of God or afraid that God doesn't love them or afraid that God's gonna get mad at them if they make a mistake, they won't do that. So everything, everything that has anything to do with peace or joy or, or being successful in life is all based on the foundation of knowing who you are in Christ, that he loves you, 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 loves you. And another word that I'm convinced we throw around a lot is God loves you unconditionally. And I think we've heard unconditionally so much that I've decided to use a little different word for a while, and that is completely. Completely. Okay, I was dealing with something this last week. You know, we, we all get convicted at different times of areas in our life where God wants us to come up higher. And so I've learned to really appreciate that conviction from the Holy Ghost. I don't mind it at all. I like it. I welcome it because to me, that's a sign that God cares about me that he loves me. And that's exactly the way he wants us to feel. You know, when I started out in my walk with God, every time God would show me something that was wrong with me, I would get condemned. But that's not what it's for. Conviction is not for condemnation. Conviction is to get us to face a situation and then deal with it with God so he can lift us out of it and make us better people. And uh, so he was dealing with me about something. And you know, when God deals with you, there's a part of you that's just like disappointed in yourself that you know, because sometimes we do stuff we don't even realize what we're doing or how it's affecting people. And when God shows you, you're like, oh, man. You know. I mean, no, no I have. And, uh, but as I was praying, I heard myself say, but you know, Lord, it's so good to know that even though you're showing me something that is not a good thing, that you want to change in me, while you're dealing with me about this, I still know that you love me completely. Now, let me tell you something, that's freedom. And it took me a lot of years to get here. And I kind of noticed you were... 
how can God love me completely if he's just told me that I'm doing something wrong? Because he doesn't love us based on what we do. And see, that's so hard for us to grasp. God doesn't love us based on what we do. He loves us because he is love. That's all he knows how to do. He doesn't know how to do anything else, amen? You have a right standing with him that's been bought and paid for with the blood of Christ. And it's not based on your works, it's based on his. We're not justified by our own works, we're justified by his. And I know that's so hard to grasp because in the world, if you hear the word free, you think that there's, there's a hidden cost somewhere. But when God says free, he really means it. And the thing is, you're like, but Joyce, it can't just not matter what I do. I didn't say it doesn't matter what you do. What I said is what you do is not going to buy God's love or get him not to love you. The whole thing is, is we get it backwards. We think if we can do enough good, God will love us. But he's already saying, no, I already love you. And I want you to do what's right and let me work with you to change you because I love you. Not See, we need to be so amazed that God loves us. Amazing. You love me completely. Even though I've been a real jerk this week. Yeah. He does. Yep. <laughs> Y'all doing good up there? I just want you to know that I know you're up there. So God gives us faith and we need to walk by that faith. And the more we know how much he loves us, the more we'll be able to exercise our faith. Luke 18 verses one and verse eight. And also Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not to turn coward, to faint, lose heart and give up. So I tell you, he will defend and protect and avenge them speedily. However, and I love this, when the Son of Man comes back, which he is coming back, you know. Yeah. Will he find persistence in faith <laughs> on the earth? Second Peter chapter three, verse 14 says, so beloved, everybody say beloved, because we're going to deal with that word here in a little bit. So beloved, since you are expecting these things, be eager to be found by him at his coming without spot or blemish. That's the first thing he says. When Jesus comes back, be determined that he's going to find no spot or blemish. Number two, and at peace. Number three, free from fear. And number four, free from agitating passions and moral conflicts. And so he puts right in the same sentence with don't be immoral, he puts don't be found in fear. God wants you to be courageous. He wants you to be bold. He wants you to pray bold prayers. Well, good, I got two people here that sound like they're... Hey, that's good. That's why God sent me. <laughs> he wants you to pray for things that you know you don't deserve. I said he wants you to pray for things that you know you don't deserve. That's why, beloved, we pray in Jesus' name, not our own. I don't say, God, I ask you to do this for me in Joyce's name. Now, yeah, that's, a, that's funny, right? We're all like, ha, well, that wouldn't get very far. But boy, you should go and read often what the Bible says in John 14 and 16 about asking in his name. And the Amplified Bible in particular says that when we ask in his name, we are presenting to God all that Jesus is. That's what it means to say in Jesus' name. We're presenting to God, look, I know I don't deserve it, so I'm not gonna waste my time praying in my name, but I'm gonna pray this bold prayer in Jesus' name, not because I think I deserve it, but because I believe it's your will. 
I'd rather ask for a lot and get half of it than ask for a little and get all of it. Come on, I'm going to say that again. I'd rather ask for a lot. I'd rather ask for a lot and even get a fourth of it. God's not going to get mad at you if you, if you ask for too much. <laughs> now, I'm not suggesting that we just be greedy. But ask, and I'm not even talking so much about things. Ask God to reveal himself to you, to speak to you, to let you do great things in the earth for him, to put you in a position where you can lift up his name and glorify him. Matter of fact, I, I think we need to not just pray about things, things, things all the time. The Bible says that if we delight ourselves in him, he will give us the secret petitions and desires of our heart. So you can let God know what you want. You don't have to camp on top of it all your life and then just, you know, I pray bold prayers. I've asked God to let me help every person on the planet. And I, you know, it's a little bit out there. But we're, we're making some progress. Amen. I'm glad I didn't just say, oh, God bless my little 20 people Bible study. I mean, not that that's not good if that's what you believe you're supposed to be doing. And, and that's what I was doing then. But hey, if you got a big vision, you better get your mouth open and start praying some bold prayers. So be found free from fear and free from agitating passions. Now, I want to say this very plainly. Fear torments. In 1 John 4, it says, fear hath torment. Now, I grew up entrenched in fear, just entrenched in fear. My father was mean, and he controlled everybody with fear. Fear of being beat up, fear of being slapped, fear of making him angry, fear of not whatever. Just fear, 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 fear. And... It has taken me a long, long time with the help of the Holy Spirit to work my way out of all that. And uh, and I still deal with things just like everybody else does. Nobody ever arrives as long as they're in a human body. It, it, it's our goal to just keep moving. <laughs> Amen. Just keep moving. Keep going forward. So... Will he find faith when he comes back? Well, what is faith? Well, Hebrews 11, 1 says, faith is the substance of things, hope for the evidence of things that we do not see. So once you have a manifestation, you don't really need faith anymore in that area. <laughs> but while you don't see what you want to see or hope to see, that's when you need faith. I have faith that God is with me tonight and that the next 10 words that come out of my mouth are going to all make sense. <laughs> Once I've already preached this message tonight and go home and hopefully feel real good about it, then I don't need faith for this anymore. Then I got to have faith that I get good sleep tonight. Then have faith that everything tomorrow works out good. We walk by faith. We live by faith. And then I particularly like a definition that the Amplified Bible gives in Colossians chapter 3 about faith, that faith is the leaning of the entire human personality on God in absolute trust and confidence in his power, his wisdom, and his goodness. His power, his wisdom, and his goodness. In other words, God has the power to do what needs to be done in your life. He has the wisdom to know how to do it right, and he's good enough that he wants to do it even for somebody like us who doesn't deserve it. Now, who could not get excited about a God like that? It aggravates me, the pictures that the world shows of Jesus sometimes. This little emaciated guy, you know. <laughs> and little baby, fat baby angels with little wings, you know. <laughs> Come on, you, you, when you run into your first angel, it's not going to be a fat little baby with little wings. <laughs> Probably going to scare the toodle out of you. <laughs> he 
Amen? Yeah. Lord, Jesus has got fire in his eyes and a sword coming out of his mouth and rides on a white charger and a robe dyed in blood. <laughs> you know, it's like, whoo. All right. <laughs> Exodus 14, 10. When Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked up, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. And the Israelites were exceedingly frightened and cried out to the Lord. Now, God was delivering them and they were being chased by the enemy. <laughs> you ever feel like that even though God is in the process of, of delivering you, that sometimes you're being chased by the enemy? And they had the Red Sea in front of them, which was an impossibility, and they're being chased by the enemy behind them. Well, that's what you call being between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> Amen? But in our instance, we've got the rock with us, and he moves the hard place. But I'm sure that we've all got some kind of Red Sea in front of us, some impossibility that we just don't know how in the world we're ever going to do that. Come on, anybody got a that in your life? I don't know how in the world I'm ever going to do that. Amen. And then if you dare look behind you, you're like, oh no, the devil's still chasing. And their temptation was to run. Where? Well, they kept wanting to run back to Egypt, which would have really been bad, but... That's what people do sometimes. They backslide all the way back where they came from because they don't want to deal with what it's going to take to go forward. And boy, that's the last thing that you want to do. And they said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you treated us this way and brought us out of Egypt? So now they're blaming Moses. That's another whole message. Did we not tell you in Egypt, let us alone, let us serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die out here in the wilderness. Now they got a bad attitude. <laughs> Come on, when you're in that place, how many of you are like, God, I just feel like I'm going to die. I just, this is going to kill me. Come on, this is just going to kill me. I just can't do this. I, this is, I just want to die. All right, thank God for verse 14. Now, I'm sorry, back to verse 13, I'm sorry. And Moses told the people, fear not, stand still, firm, confident, undismayed, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians you have seen today, you will never see again.